welcome all to the session by Matt Turner on the cloud native progressive delivery. Oh, Matt is an engineer and uh, no, he would like to share his tech talks uh, no, to, with everyone. So once again, welcome Matt to the session. Over Thank to you, you Matt. Welcome you Thank once again. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Welcome everyone. Uh, I can't see you, but I hope you can see me. Um, Good morning or your evening or afternoon wherever it is where you are i'm in uh, alabama at the moment in america so the sun's just starting to come up um well i hope you're enjoying agile india there's a bunch of great talks out there so thank you very much for everyone who's come along to this one yeah i'm going to talk about cloud native progressive delivery so what i'm what this is going to be maybe a little more technical than than some of the talks uh, at an agile conference but it's not going to require too much you know, sort of technical understanding. You don't need to be an engineer. I'm just going to focus on technical stuff rather than people stuff, I guess, in this. Um, so I'm going to talk about progressive delivery, which is a way to, uh, I guess, more easily and safely and ultimately quickly deliver value to customers, right? It's the, it's the whole, uh, I, I think it plays into what we're looking for with, with agile and lean you know, technologies. It's our ability to, to, you know, to run experiments quickly, to not hold inventory, all of that kind of stuff. And I think a lot of people get the, the people side, the, the software engineering, you know, the, the sort of team structures right, but then they get held up by the practical details of getting the, the releases, get the new features into the hands of users you know, safely. Maybe they'll run some, some fast sprints, do some, some real innovation, and then just release the software and there's a bug and they have to, they have to roll everything back. Um, or vice versa, you know, a, a team will deliver very quickly, uh, very incrementally, but then things will not actually reach users for several months because it's it's held up, you know, getting deployed ultimately to the sort of final production environment because people are worried about those changes or something. So anyway, I'll, I'll take you through that. The cloud native part is talking about the fact that I'm going to be looking at these new cloud native technologies. So if you're running your software in a cloud, if you're using... Uh, a Kubernetes system um, and some other technology that I'll show you. Um, I think that's a real enabler for what we're trying to do. So uh, I, I'm a software engineer. I work at Tetrate. I just need to mention that quickly. We make software that helps you with your journey from on-premise into the cloud or helps you run a hybrid environment with on-premise and cloud. It, it helps you with app modernization, you know, altogether if you're if you've got containers but struggling to run them, if you're going from VMs to containers, uh, as I say, if you've got a, a hybrid on cloud, on-premise kind of environment, then we we make a bunch of software that can help with that. And that's based on cloud native technologies as well. It's based on the same technology that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, so I can't see you because this is online. I would normally start by asking, you know, whose uh, really software release process looks like this. You know, whose is is a nice, simple, um, fun, <laughs> enjoyable, you know, walk in a straight line. I guess it. I, I'm going to guess it's not too many, too many people's, right? You know, whether you're, uh, I guess, not too many people are, are now making printing software onto disk and and putting it in a box and shipping it. And, you know, I guess most of us are delivering an app or a website uh, or an API or something like that. Um, I'm guessing not many people sort of path to, you know, from, from feature inception to, to having users, you know, use our software and getting feedback looks too much like this. It maybe looks like this. Um, I, I Googled for this, I'll be honest, but uh, it, it, it's quite similar to release processes I've had to work with before. Uh, or maybe it looks like this. Um, some people can maybe tell me, you know, what the name for uh, this particular approach is, but it looks very complicated to me. Uh, maybe it looks like this. I think this is something we need a consultant to help us understand. This this diagram doesn't seem to have a lot of meaning, but either way, it's likely to be, you know, quite complicated, quite involved in, in taking a lot of steps. Like more more realistically, maybe we have something that looks like this. You know, this is this is safe. Uh, scaled agile everybody here is, is very familiar i'm sure we have a release train and we have all these departments with testing and quality and operations and everything just takes a lot of paperwork and it takes a lot of time so how can we do something better how can we get closer to that first picture well i'm going to tell you that cloud native technology can help us with this um 
for those who aren't familiar, I'm just going to give an overview of, of some of the tech that I'm talking about. This will be quite a whistle stop tour. Uh, if you haven't heard of any of this stuff before, you might just want to take some notes and, and go and Google it, I guess. Like I say, there won't be any, any code, um, but there's a few different things I will I do need to introduce. So we have a piece of software. I'm, if, if you're making an app or whatever, then then that's great. Like all of this, I think, applies. But I'm going to be talking about a sort of a more modern application, I guess, right? A business that's running a SaaS product. So um, I'm going to assume that we're writing, you know, code that runs on the server side and either either gives an, a website or an API or some other kind of SaaS, SaaS offering, you know, a, a web app, some kind of SaaS offering to the user. So we have our code, you know, it has to run somewhere. Maybe it runs on a server or something at the moment. And there's this idea in tech called the 12 factor app. So this is a set of guidelines that tell us uh, a, a good way to go about writing modern applications. So I'm going to assume that we're writing microservices um, or that we're, you know, we're on a journey there. And the 12 factor app tells us a lot about how to write a good microservice. Um, so I'll, I'll come to a few of its, its recommendations. So I think the first thing we should do is use Docker. You know, we should run our code in a, in a container. Um, if you're not familiar with that, it's definitely worth looking up. It's uh, a, a nice way to isolate your running code so that we can sort of safely make changes to it. So one of the things that the 12 factor, uh, it's 12 factor, by the way, is a list of 12, uh, you know, 12 recommendations for our software. Um, so it's number five as it happens. But one of the things that 12 factor says is that the building of our code and the running of our code should be kept separate. So what I'm showing here on the right is our code, you know, built and packaged up and ready to run. So we're building these container images. If you've ever worked with Java and built a jar or a war, or if you've ever packaged anything into a, you know, a, a pip for Python or, or a VM machine image, anything like that, containers have the same kind of idea. So we can do a build of our software we don't build it on the server that we run it on, I guess, is, is the point. We do a build of the software. We package it up into some format. For a container, that would be a container image. And then that sits in this registry ready to run. And then when it actually runs, it runs in Docker um, with that isolation that I was talking about. So we separated the building and the running. As I say, I'm going to assume we're doing microservices. You know, there's there's been books written on this. The, the stuff that Sam Newman writes and Martin Fowler is all very good. But... You know, our software isn't going to be one homogenous blob. Um, it's going to be several different pieces of software, several different services working together. Um, and you can start when you understand microservices, you can start to sort of see patterns in them. There might be different types of service doing different things. But importantly, we've got different pieces of software um, that can be all run in these containers to isolate them. And importantly, they can all be deployed separately this is this was the original sort of point of microservices is i take the code base and i split it up and that means that if i add a feature in one place i can deploy just that part of the code without having to wait for that agile release train or whatever mechanism without having to deploy everything at once because that's a much bigger job it's more risky uh, and it's the kind of uh, you know thing that will introduce delays the other thing about these microservices if you've you know not seen this pattern before is that they can all scale separately. So maybe one part of the code has to do a lot of work. One part of the code, you know, does does less work. Um, you know, one deals with account creation, right? Doesn't happen very often. And one deals with orders, which happens all the time. We can add more replicas. It's just like adding more servers. We can add more replicas of one of them without the other. So we we scale out just part of our code, and that it just is very that's very efficient. It's, it saves us duplicating. Uh, running multiple copies of all of this code when we don't need it. You should then, I said, this is going to be a whistle-stop tour through the tech. Um, I can't see anybody nodding, so I don't know how familiar people are with this stuff. But when we have our, our software in containers in these, in these Docker images, we then need to actually, uh, you know, run it um, on, on many servers. You know, we want to run, even if we don't have very many users, we're going to want to run three copies of all of these services just for redundancy in case one of those servers crashes and when we've got lots of users you know the scaling that i showed of the services then we're going to need lots of servers to make 
uh, you know, all those all those duplicates of our software we run. We're going to just need a lot of server space to, to run all of that code. So uh, you, I'm sure you've heard of Kubernetes, everyone, even if you're not too familiar with it. Kubernetes is a, is a sort of platform. It's an orchestrator. It's a, it's a piece of software that will organize running our containers for us, right? So I just give it a lot. I installed it on a load of servers. And I give it a load of these container images and I say, hey, run 10 copies of that and 100 copies of that. And it'll just go and do it and it'll spread them out across the different servers. It'll restart them if they crash. It's got it's got all kinds of features that, that you can look up. But taking taking that step to write microservices and you know build them into Docker containers is is great. It's great for devs, but if you're still you know manually um using SSH or RDP or whatever to connect to a server and then that's how you run a new service and that's how you upgrade a service, then we're not going to get the agility. We're not going to get that speed that we need because that's still going to be a whole load of manual work. You know, we have the first step, but we don't have all of the steps. So Kubernetes, which is kind of like an automated sysadmin, is going to be a very important part of that. When we're running Kubernetes, we can add a, an add-on called Istio, um, which is a a thing called a service mesh. What that can do is make the network much more uh, clever, much more sophisticated. So that when each of these services talks to another one, you know, when each of our software, when our orders software talks to our users software, talks to our basket software, all of that goes through this this Istio network. So these uh, these purple boxes here show a a network proxy um, that Istio is going to inject into all of our containers so when one container talks to another when one service talks to another all of this all of the you know those requests go through these these purple boxes um and you can see up at the top that little sailboat is um a a piece of software that's that's controlling and configuring all of those boxes again so that so that we don't have to um and what this means is that we get uh, a whole bunch of insights into the network we get a whole bunch of insights into what's going on so uh for example we can run some kind of metric system and we can get graphs of how much cpu our software is running or how much memory it's using or importantly we can get graphs of, of how many errors right so when we're talking about about being agile and and you know delivering incrementally and progressively and as fast as we can if I go and deploy a new version of, of one of these services of, of some of my software, I need to know what its error rate is, right? It's great if it adds a new feature, but if it makes 10 times as many errors as the previous one, then I need to see that on a graph and I need to be able to roll it back. Um, so by using Kubernetes, we get the statistics about whether this software just you know, crashes in its containers. Um, and those containers isolate that so that it doesn't crash all the other software, but we can know whether each part crashes and then by using this Istio, this service mesh, because all of the requests are going through these purple boxes, you know, they can observe uh, what's going on. And if one piece of software returns an error to another, then again, we can see the, the sort of response error rate, rate on a graph like this. So the normal way we look at these metrics, because we'll, we'll talk about this a little later, is, um, what's called red red metrics so that stands for rate error and duration so basically for every service for every part of my software i want to know how many requests it's getting you know that's the rate are 10 users using it or a thousand errors is well okay so there's a thousand users using it how many of them what percentage get an error so if 100 get an error you know that's a 10 percent error rate and my software is should probably be rolled back right that's that's not going to give a good experience to to a lot of users if it's one error in a thousand then maybe that's okay because that's a 0.1 percent error rate and you can decide that in your business you know what kind of uh, experience you want to give to your users how you balance uh potentially having users see an error with getting features out there quickly right if you're a sort of early stage in your startup, if this is a beta feature, you might accept some errors. It might be okay for some users to have a bad experience if you're getting features out there really quickly and testing hypotheses really quickly. But the, you need to be able to see, right? You need to be able to know what that error rate is so that you can make an informed decision about whether 1% or 5% is, is okay or is not. 
And then the last one is D for duration. And this is how long a response takes because, you know, say I'm on my, on your, I'm on your store and I'm trying to order something that you sell, you know, even if there's no errors, even if every page, you know, the, the, the browse page and then the basket page, and then the orders page, if all of those pages load, okay, but each one takes 10 seconds, then I'm probably going to go to a different store, right? I'm probably going to get bored and move away. So even if something is technically okay, a response is, you know, response is good. I need to know how long it takes because uh, they need to be really quickly to sort of keep customer engagement. And when, when we have those statistics, we can start talking about them. We can start writing contracts, contract in the technical sense, right? Uh, not, not a big deal. Um, but I can start writing something like a service level agreement, which says, okay, I make the orders part of this software um, and my agreement with everybody because all the uh, other services have to interact with orders, right? The basket has to interact with it and the shipping component has to interact with it. My service level agreement is, okay, I will, I will write a service that lets you place new orders and list all the orders and cancel orders. You know, I will be the order service that, that validates those and that stores those in the database and, and, and all that kind of stuff. That's probably what I'm offering you. Um, and, you know, this is the API to interact with that. We can then talk about a service level objective, which is saying, right, I'm going to offer you that orders API and 99% of queries to it are going to, are going to succeed. You know what, there may be 1% errors, but we're moving quickly. We're adding features quickly. You know, there, there are going to be some errors. Um, we don't have the time to test everything, but my objective is that it's only 1%. And my objective is that every API call gets a response in one second, right? That's the kind of thing we have with a service level objective. Uh, and this is, I think this is just really, really useful when you, when you start doing microservices and you have multiple teams working on different services, like separately that have to interact with each other being explicit about what you're going to get and what it's going to look like from from the other services writing that down is very useful um, and the service level indicator is basically just saying well how do we measure that so for um you know 99 success rate it's it's quite obvious you know we just look at the responses and we see whether it's a, a 200 or a 500 um but for we can write contracts about other aspects of, of what these services do. And some of those can be a little bit more difficult to measure. So sometimes you have to write that down. Uh, I'll actually just say that, so this is what these purple boxes do, right? This is what this, this service mesh technology does um, within Kubernetes or within uh, ECS or something is it's, it's going to gather those metrics for you, those service level um, objectives, right? It's, it's fine to have a, an SLO that says, 99% of my responses will be will be good. Um, but that's useless if I can't measure them. So because every request between the services goes through these purple boxes, the purple boxes, the proxies, they get to inspect that traffic and uh, and produce those metrics, right? That's that's why we're using that technology. We're using it so we can we can enable sort of business level um, design by contract like this. Just another couple of things I'll very quickly mention. I don't want to spend forever on the tech. Um, I, I say, say I don't know whether people are super familiar with this or whether this is completely new. Um, there's another couple of ways you probably want to build these platforms. One is with um, what's called infrastructure as code tooling. So we don't set our servers up. We don't set our Kubernetes software up um, by going and, and you know, clicking through an options dialog. Uh, all these manual processes, we you know we have we do them once, and then if there's if we need to rebuild the system, we have to do them again, and we we forget the settings we chose last time, right? Um, we write everything down as as configuration as code. We can store it in Git, and then we can do we can just rebuild the environment or make a change to the environment really quickly by changing that code in Git and then rerunning it, and it will go and configure our production environment for us. Um, and Okay, very quickly, I mentioned, yeah, GitOps, which is the idea of you, you have all of that, all that code describing what your, your server environment, your production environment is going to be like. You have all of that sat in a Git repository, and then you have an automated piece of software. You have an agent that uh, watches what is in that Git repository and uh, makes it, and it goes and builds it in the cloud, right? So um, if, if I'm on the platform team, 
and I want to make a change to to how this production environment is is functioning. I don't actually I don't I don't go into the AWS console and click something. I'll go into this code in the Git repository, and I'll make a change in that piece of code. And then as soon as I commit it to Git, uh, you know, no human has to do anything. A piece of software will will notice the new commit to Git, and it will go and run that code, and then AWS will will look like what I wanted. So with with all of these pieces, we've automated all of the way. Right. So if I yeah if I want to change something in AWS, I want to add a domain name or whatever I want to do, you know, I don't log in and, and click. Um, I write one of these configuration files, I commit it to the Git repo, and then everything just automatically happens. You know, a few seconds later, AWS is going to look the way I want. And this um, just this just gives us this speed and this reproducibility. And this is what lets us be agile, right? This is what is, lets us respond to, to users' um, requirements very quickly. It's what lets us do, do the lean manufacturing thing, because as soon as I've had that idea and you know got got PR approval, got that change merged into Git. That you know that stock isn't held back. That hypothesis is out there being tested because it's automatically you know deployed all the way into AWS. So let's actually look at the deployment of our own software. Hopefully that gave you a you know an overview of the kind of technology that we can use to enable this. Um, but how how are we actually going to use it? So uh, just another couple more terms. Um, people say CI, CD a lot, right? I'm sure you've heard CI, CD a lot. The CI in, in CI, CD stands for continuous integration. This used to have a different meaning, but now it basically just means continuous build. It should really be CB, CD, I guess. So the same kind of deal. If I'm working on my piece of software, you know, we're using Git as soon as I make a commit. Uh, an agent Jenkins or something like that will go off at Circle CI or whatever will go off and uh, build my software. Tell me whether the build succeeds or fails. You know, make that that package that that pip or that jar or in our case that container image and, and put it somewhere ready to be deployed potentially. So when people say the CI in CI CD, what they just really mean is continuously going and and building every commit of the software, and that's fine. I just wanted to to clarify it. So, okay, if we're defining terms, if we're saying what words mean, what is a deployment, right? Because we talk about CD. We talk, well, I've, I've said a lot about deploying software so far, right? But I, I haven't actually explained what I mean. So is deployment, you know, taking one of those software packages that we built, the, the jar or the container image and running it? Well, I, I think it is. So continuous deployment, the, the CD part of CI CD, that means continuously doing this deployment, right? So every time there's been a new build, every time uh, you know, a new jar, a new container image has been made, we, we deploy it. We take that software and we run it. Okay, great. So what is progressive delivery then? Well, that actually depends on what we mean by release so when i said de deployment right i said take a piece of software and run it and we might assume that if we you know we're running that piece of software in production in the aws in the kubernetes cluster that users will start interacting with it right i i take the built piece of software i go and run it in production then any user that comes to my site is going to see that software right well i think not necessarily because it's you know strictly defined Deployment means, means take the code and run it in production. Release, my definition for release, is exposing that software to users, having users use that software. So what would continuous release be? Well, continuous release would be for every new deployment, for every new running piece of software, automatically exposing users to it, right? Automatically putting it on the the main path that users take so exposing users to every new build so if we do continuous integration continuous you know build ci and we do cd and we do continuous release that means every commit makes a container image every container image starts running and every running container image is exposed to the user right so as soon as i do a commit the user starts using it if that commit is bad the user has a bad time. 
So I think CICD is good, and I think we can keep doing CICD. But when most people say CICD, they include this continuous release step, right? They they assume that the deployment means releasing. They assume that running the software means that that's the software the users interact with. But what if we say that deployment and release are not the same thing, that I can deploy software without releasing it to users? I'm going to try to hopefully persuade you in, in 20 minutes that that's a good idea. And I'm going to show you that we have the technology to do that, that we can use those cloud native technologies that I just explained to enable this. So one last thing that, uh, that the 12 factor um, guide says, point 10, is that you know development and, and production environment should, should be the same. So keeping devel, staging, production, pre-production, whatever you call it, as similar as possible. So actually, you know, I've been assuming so far that we that we re don't have a staging environment even, right? That we only have one. Because I when I said CICD, I said, oh yes, you deploy to to production, right? Um, and I think you should do that. I think you should always do. I think you should deploy straight to production. But if deployment isn't equal to release, then that's not dangerous because the user doesn't start using the software that we've deployed. Anyway, let me let me show a diagram. Maybe it's a little easier to explain it. So, using all of this cloud native technology, what do I think um, the the perfect build and, and deployment and release system should look like? Okay, so what's that build stage? I write some code. The little green scroll here is is code. That's the best icon I can find, um, and I commit to Git. Right? Some some agent, you know, the, the gears are as a, as a piece of software. Some piece of software comes along, and it builds what's in Git. And it puts a little artifact in you know, the, the database symbol is you know, some kind of store, right? So uh, it's an abstract diagram, but if you think about how your software probably works, uh, this is probably what you have at the moment, right? You write some code in Java, you commit it to, to Git, Jenkins builds a jar and puts that in Artifactory, say. Or you write some code in Python, you commit it to Git and CircleCI, Builds that Python, packages that Python, and, and puts a, a pip in PyPy, right? And this would this applies to to sort of any language, any ecosystem you're in. So the contract from this is that every any you know any new commit to main, any merged PR produces well in our case a container image because we're using cloud native technologies, and it pushes it into that image registry. So what is deploy then? So I've got this this line here because I build and deploy should always be very separate. Um, I think a lot of people are, are halfway down this path. Maybe they haven't thought about it too clearly, but a lot of people have ended up building systems where they're, like, they're quite separate anyway. So I've got you know, the build that we just talked about, that's on the left, that happens completely independently of anything, everything else. So what I then have is this Git repo here, a different Git repo, with files in that say what version of my software should be deployed, right? Because for every commit to this to this software on the left, every version in Git, we build it and we make a, you know, a jar or a, a pip or a container image, and this has a version on, right? So we're gonna have a big registry of, oh, I've got, you know, the version one of the software, version two, version three. They're all there, we could, we could take them all and run them all. So I have a Git repo, with a file in that says, hey, right, version two should be running. And then there's, an, there's a piece of software here, this, this cycle symbol that's constantly watching. So there's this piece of software that's going to say, OK, um, the file in, in Git says we should be running version two. I'm going to go and run two containers of version two. Right? You see these are all, these are all the, green, the green version. Um, so yeah, a bit of an abstract diagram, but this this is using that technology we talked about. If people are familiar with this, right? So this software is running in a Docker container, so it's going to be Kubernetes that that goes and starts this. You know, I haven't drawn any servers, any VMs, any VMware, anything like that, because it kind of isn't relevant when we use all of this automation technology. We just rely on on Kubernetes to make it happen. So. What happens normally if if I do if I set this this system up right this continuous because this is a continuous deployment system at the end of the day it's just a little bit different from 
the Jenkins or the um, the Spinnaker or whatever you might have used at the you know at the moment um, because it's continuously you know deploying the software every time I make a, a commit to this Git repo on the right say oh I want to run version three a piece of software will notice that straight away and it will come and run you know version it'll come and run version three in production so we are continuously deploying stuff now what happens by default I've got a, a you know a user down here trying to access my my stuff they send their request the request hits this this gray boxes you know sort of the, the load balancer or the the cloud edge or whatever you want to call it it hits the sort of network ingress point and then all of the requests go uh you know to, to the version that we're running right so at the moment we're in a happy state we've got you know this green version version two that's what's described in the git repository that's what's running and any, every user request is going to go to version two what happens if i do another commit in git right of of new code of my new feature um, I'm super excited about this feature, but it's it's brand new and it hasn't had a lot of, you know, I've done all the testing I can, all the unit testing, the bottom of the agile testing pyramid, right? But we haven't gone all the way up yet. We haven't been able to test it um, in the real world. Well, because everything's automated, because we're being really agile and really fast, my new commit gets built, results in a, you know, a version three, a, a red um, image in the container image repository, and then the continuous deployment system kicks in right and we suddenly get version three running in in the cluster as well and what's going to happen by default is that for all those user requests coming in half are going to vote to version two and half to version three because this is a, this is a dumb load balancer right it, it balances load so it sees that there's now four containers it doesn't really understand that they're different versions so it just spreads the traffic between them so now instantly because we've got continuous integration and we've got continuous deployment this brand new code that might not be very good is you know exposed to half of the users half of the users are going to see that new feature which is great start testing our hypothesis but half of the users are also going to hit this code that maybe crashes quite a lot right or maybe gives them the uh, bad results so what can we do about it and this i think is the sort of the crux of this progressive delivery we had another agent another piece of software um but it's all good right this is all automation we had another piece of software that controls that load balancer for us so this is going to be um an elb or an alb if you're on amazon something like that um or it's going to be part of that service mesh i won't go into the, the technical details but there's a, there's another piece of software here that can control that load balancer for you right because if 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 this happens if continuous deployment deploys our new version and we see that half of the traffic is going to it we might come along and change those load balancer settings really quickly right uh you know as the person who owns this app i'm like oh version three is maybe not ready yet let me just go and change the the elb setting to send all of the traffic to version two just just for a while just to be careful so we can have a software agent that comes and does that for us and that's just you know safer and quicker and easier i'll, I'll move on a little bit because i realize i'm getting towards the end of the time so that little that little agent it's forcing all of the users to get to go to the green version to go to version two but we've done continuous deployment i think continuous deployment is a good thing so this new untested version is running and it's running in prod but it's not been released right it's not exposed to users so the users are not seeing it but we we can do that by using this load balancer by controlling this load balancer Right, because otherwise, if we wanted to test this new piece of software, we deploy it into into dev or into staging or into whatever you want to call it, into a completely separate environment. But it's expensive to run that environment. It's expensive to maintain that environment. That environment is never going to look exactly like prod, right? They they just never do as as hard as we try. So that testing is never going to be as good as it could be. So I think we should continuously deploy, continuously deploy and deploy into prod, but with these new this new cloud native tech with things like this this agent and this smart load balancer coming from the service mesh we can control what the users see so the users are when they send their request they're getting version two but version three is sat there running so what can we do well we can start testing it you know our our tester can also access exactly the same thing so that the tester is now not using a, like a staging environment or something the tester is using the production environment there may be accessing exactly the same dns name that that the users do but if they set an http header 
to say, hey, I want to opt into the testing version, they can send a request, they can send their the, you know, the postman requests or whatever that they use for testing, they can send to exactly the same ingress point of exactly the same production environment, and get a very representative test, but they just set this one header and the load balancer is smart enough to send their request to version three, where the users are still getting the safe version two. We can also have, you know, other kinds of testing can, can go on to the, this agent that's um, controlling the load balancer for us. You know, it's it sees version two is deployed, it sees version three is deployed, um, and it goes, ah, yes, version three is still under testing, so I'm going to send all the user traffic to version two, but I'm going to spin up an automated testing system, you know, an automated test script, uh, and I'm going to tell I'm going to tell it where version three is, so that it so you know if this is sort of a manual tester, we can go even further, and we can have you know, the agent that's that's managing all these deployments, we can have it start up automated testing scripts, even you know even load testing. So this is you know sending a, a lot of traffic in. Uh, I'll skip this because I'm running a little short on time. Um, yes, basically the point is that it's this is fiddly. Um, you know, there's a lot of moving parts here. This is hard to do. We need a lot of automation. We need a lot of technology. But when we do, I think we're in a really, really good place. So just quickly, you know, what else can this agent do? Well, it can let version three sit there for a while, you know, with no traffic except um, our, our testers who access it by by sending a header. It can, but it can it can test this stuff in multiple ways. So the other thing it can do, excuse me, <coughs> all these user requests that come in, it can mirror them to version three. So you see here, you know, version two is gets the user requests, and the replies that version two gives are what goes back to the user. We can send the same request duplicates of them to version three. But you see, the the arrow doesn't come back. This is not the response the user sees. Um, but version three is getting these requests. And giving responses and because we're using this service mesh right all of these things have a little proxy alongside them we can see the responses come out of version three and they just get thrown away they don't get re returned to the user we just we just throw them away but before we do that we can see whether they're good or bad we can see whether they were an error or not we can see how long they took so we can get the metrics for version three and we can compare to version two and say right it's got this new feature in but it's got 1% more errors and it takes 50 milliseconds longer. And we can then say to the product owner, to the business, is this acceptable? How keen are you to get version three out there? Uh, so yeah, this is, uh, I skipped ahead a bit. This is uh, saying that we can inspect, you know, well, we can inspect that service. I guess we can see if it just crashes, maybe it gets the same request as V2, V2 handles them okay, V3 crashes. Very useful to know that. And because we're testing this in production, we're going to get a much better idea, right? You're thinking staging, uh, the only request the software gets is, is something we've come up with, some, some request that we have we have designed. Nothing is ever going to be as crazy as a user request, right? So, so by letting it get a copy of all the user requests, all the crazy, crazy input that the users sent to our app, we can see whether it crashes. We can see whether the response is any good. We can even compare the two, right? So if we have a an API, um, if we, you know, if we're a, if we're a SaaS solution, then we can send all the user requests to version two and version three. They both send their responses, and we can compare and say, oh, version three is is returning different responses to, you know, version three should be faster. That was the plan, but it's actually returning different responses. Is that okay? So what is so what is release right? So this is deployment. This is continuous deployment. We've got this software running as soon as it's been committed, and we can then it's it's sitting there, and we can go and test it. We can send we can do manual testing of it. We can do automated testing of it. We can send we can mirror user traffic, but the user doesn't get a response. So then when when all of that has told us that the software is good or we think it's good, we can then actually release it. Remember that releasing is exposing the software to the users, right? So again, this agent can do some more control of the load balancer and it can say, right, most of the trap, we think we think version three is good. We've done as much you know, testing as we can. We've, we've given it the mirrored request and everything, but we still still want to be a little bit, a little bit careful. Um, most of the requests should still go to version two, but let's send 1% to version three and let the users actually have the response. And see if the users complain, right? See if users, see if our 
metrics, say that users are dropping out of the funnel or whatever. And yeah, we can we can watch the statistics for these services, uh, the, you know, all the way through to see how they're getting on. We can then send a little bit more to version three, and if it still seems to be good, you know, the metrics are still good, the user's still happy, we can send even more, and then eventually it can get all of the traffic, and this is now our running version. And this is nothing we couldn't have done before, right? But it's just very, very difficult to, if you've got, you know, Windows servers and jars, and you're doing this manually, you know, like going and reconfiguring a, an on-premise load balancer, this is very difficult. What I'm saying to you in this talk is that, the, the cloud native technology, you know, the cloud providers, the Kubernetes, the Istio, all of this kind of tech makes this easy and, and automates it. So everything we've seen here has been completely automated and like a user hasn't had to do it. So we've gone through all these stages of, of all these different ways of testing, all these um, stages of, of being careful and of gathering data and of sort of scientifically moving on with our software rollout, but no humans had to had to put the effort in this can happen overnight this can happen all very quickly uh if we tell the agent to move from one stage to the next very quickly it can happen very slowly if we tell the agent to be very careful um and then just to round off if you actually want to go and build this um there's there's various technology that fits in all of these boxes um but in this case i've used um a tool called Flux from Weaveworks for the for that continuous deployment piece. I've used a tool called Flagger from Weaveworks for the um, for that automated rollout um, agent. And then, as I say, everything is running in Kubernetes with with Istio. And my company Tetrate make a, a platform that helps you manage that Istio because that's a very big important part. That's those proxies that give you all of these. Um, uh, all of these insights into your platform and what gives you the control over this traffic. So running that is important and quite difficult, and we make a platform that can help you with that. Uh, there are there, there are other solutions out there. We could change Flux for Argo. We could change Flagger for Argo. We could change Istio for LinkedIn. So I just wanted to say that, you know, I am agnostic to this, um, and there's other ways of doing it. So I think that's just about on time. I will end there. Um, I guess the host is going to come back in and say what's next, but I think there's a, I don't have time for any questions now, but I think there's going to be sort of 20 minutes where I'm, I'm going to be hanging out in a uh, breakout room. So thank you very much.